Good morning. Welcome to Stony Creek United Methodist Church. I am Pastor Michael. I'm very happy to see you all here today uh, for our worship service. And welcome to those of you joining us online or uh, listening to this later on our podcast or our call in number. Uh, today is a beautiful day that God has made. And I think we've got some announcements maybe over there. Do you got something? Uh. Wednesday is the lunch in Dundee at Chinese Sizzling. It'll be at 11.30 down there. There are some items left from the rummage sale on the tables in uh, the fellowship hall. So if there's, if you wanna look through there and see if there's any treasures that, you know, <laughs> somebody's junk is the other one's treasures, so. Feel free to look. Say so there's two sets of golf clubs, I think. There's four sets of golf four clubs. Four sets of golf clubs. So so right there, somebody can go for it. That's a, you, you have four in a group, right? When you go out, uh, you're I supposed to. I do mini golf. Uh, I don't do a lot I don't golf, golf. I, unless it's mini. Um, so all right, nothing else? All mm -hmm. right, anybody else got anything for the good of the cause? Going once, twice, sold. Fantastic. That is just some of the, the stuff we have going on here. Thank you to... Everyone who stopped by on the rummage sale that the Work and Play Cafe put on, I think they had a really good turnout. There were, the parking lot was pretty full of cars. There were lots of little people running around everywhere. Um, we have 18 goldfish now at my house. Um, Whoa. We bought a 29 gallon tank, because I must, yeah, I am. It says, it, it flashes neon on my forehead. Um, I can't let an animal die. So anyway, um, I'm going to turn things over to our praise band who's going to get us started. I invite you to rise for our first song out of the red <coughs> folder, and I forgot the number. Number six. Yes, we will join together in the red folder number six. And if you can stand to join us, that would be great. Our second song to give you a heads up, that will be in the black hymnal that you would find near you or maybe in front of you in the pew. Uh, that would be our second song and we'll be seated for that. That's in the black hymnal. The first song is number six, Red Folder. <laughs> It does have two short verses, so when you sing the first three lines, then we'll circle back to the beginning for that short second verse. Open our eyes.
says to stand, but it's okay with me if you sit down all the time. We do the opening prayer together. Redeeming, Redeeming God, God, you call you us to be one with you as you are one with Christ. As his perfect love casts out our fear and changes it to love, unite us by your spirit of peace that we may be one with you as you are one with Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus said to the Father, all mine are yours and all yours are mine. Therefore, let us offer to God this day our lives and labors in the service of Christ's love. rise as you are able and join in our doxology number 95 in the hymnal. God, everything that is given to us reigns forth out of the abundance of your love, even Jesus Christ, our Lord. Bless these gifts and our lives together. 
that all we are and all we offer give glory to you in the name of Christ, who is the way, truth, and life. Amen. You may be seated, and I invite you to join me in prayer, in the prayer that Jesus taught us as children of God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You may remain seated for our next hymn, because you you were just standing. And this isn't an exercise class. Uh, Number 110, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Now is the time that we bring before God and God's people the things that weigh upon our hearts and our minds, as well as those that give us cause for celebration. Do we have any joys and concerns we'd like to lift up this morning? Oh, okay. I couldn't hear myself. (laughs) 
I just got back from visiting my friend in Canada, and while I was there on Tuesday, she went into the hospital. She had been having a lot of pain in her neck and her head, and um, she was still there when I left Thursday morning. I was really worried, but she called me Thursday night. They had sent her home. They think she has an infection in her artery, and that if uh, it is, and they don't get it taken care of, that she could go blind. It was that serious. They had a long name for it. But anyway, she came home Thursday night, and I just got a note from her sister that they're going to do a biopsy on that artery on Tuesday. So let's pray for my friend Gloria, and that everything will come out okay. As you know, I work at uh, Stony Creek Daycare, and we have a grandma there that is raising her two little um, grandchildren. Um, Sammy is almost two, and I think Alonzo is six. But she just got diagnosed with stage three lung cancer um, and struggling with this whole thing. The parents are not in the picture at all. So if you could pray for Samantha. to bring you up to date on Leon. Um, he had a fall this past weekend in the middle of the night. Instead of calling for me, I was only two feet away sleeping. I would have woken up immediately. He didn't, and he tried to reach for something, and he fell on his butt. He's in better shape than I am because I struggled for an hour, and I thought I was going to lose my mind. I did kind of lose my mind. Finally called the paramedics and whatever, and they came in a truck and a wagon, and Boy, they lifted him up like a sack of sugar and set him back in his chair, and he seems much better than I am. So he's, I, I ask for your continued prayers. We both need him. Thank you. Do we have any others? Um, I'd like to add one more to our list. There is a family um, at the Bishop's School I think the oldest is either in first or second grade. Um, their father has been in the hospital and he passed away. Um, I think the funeral is sometime this week. Um, and there's at least, there's two or three kids. They're all very, very young. So if you can please keep that family in your prayers as well. If you could turn to hymn number 177, He is Lord, for our invitation to prayer. please join me in an attitude of prayer. Redeeming God, you call us to devote ourselves constantly to prayer for the sake of Jesus Christ. Therefore, let us offer our prayers this day on behalf of your church and the world, saying, fill us with your Spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Rescuing God, parents of orphans and protector of widows, you give the desolate a home to live in and lead out the prisoners into prosperity. Help us to order the patterns of our common life to support the health of your human family and the welfare of your world. We especially lift up a young family in our local school who has lost their father and will be in great need. Fill us with your Spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Steadfast God, you have given to your church the inheritance of faith in Christ alone and bestowed upon your Spirit's love upon us to make us one in you. 
Help us to grow in strength and courage to witness to this hope that all may find your saving love eternally in Christ. Fill us with your Spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Life-giving God, you send rain in abundance to relieve the parched crops and thirsty land, and you may clean the winds of heaven. Help us to find sustainable solutions as we seek to honor and care for the well-being of your creation. Fill us with your Spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Loving God, you heard the sufferings of your people, listened to our cries, and sent a son into our world that was no stranger to our pain. Help us to offer your healing and compassion as we minister to others in the mercy of your Christ. We especially lift up Gloria, Samantha, and Leon and pray for their healing and their protection. Fill us with your Spirit's power that we may be one with Christ as Christ is one with you. Resurrecting God, you draw near to those who are sick and dying and you call them home to you. May we all know the joy of eternal life shared with you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would please join me aloud in our prayer for illumination. Spirit of glory, Spirit of God, bless us with the word of life this day to restore, support, and strengthen us as we seek to be one with you. Amen. Well, my first scripture reading is from uh, First Peter, and I'm always a little, I wander around my house for a couple days, and I look through the four or five Bibles that I have in different places to find out if it says something before First Peter to see if it means anything more to me than I, it already does. So I picked up this, and I'll read it to you, and then we'll do the scripture. The first general epistle of Peter the Apostle was written in Babylon, which is a moniker for Rome or Jerusalem. And I say, pick a name and stick with it. Why we have all these different names for different places and different people, I don't know. It was written by Peter somewhere between, between 62 and 63 AD during the reign of the Roman Emperor Nero. Peter, also called Simon or Cephas, and there we go again, more than one name, right? Was a native fisherman of Bethsaida, Bethesda, I don't know. First Peter asks believers to endure all kinds of suffering, which is a dominant theme of the epistle. Since Peter was the traditional source of information used by Mark in his gospel, it is recommended, if you want, that you read First and Second Peter along with the gospel of Mark for further insight. At any rate, here is First Peter, chapter 4, verses 12 through 14, chapter 5, verses 6 through 11. Suffering for being a Christian. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. 
This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And now, if you would stand for the next hymn in your hymnal, Wonder 127, I think. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. be seated. Our second reading today can be found on page 1077 in the Bibles in the pews. We are in the book of Acts, also known as the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, reading verses 6 through 14. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are, at, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and the cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they had been staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphas, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. If you would please join me once again in an attitude of prayer. Loving God, you are always more ready to hear our prayers than we are to offer them. Sometimes we forget that we can come to you with anything in prayer. Sometimes we feel certain things may not be worthy of prayer. But Jesus taught us to bring everything to you in prayer. Help us through the power of your Holy Spirit to seek your guidance through prayer at any and all times in our lives. May we find peace and direction when we lift our prayers to you in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And now may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts together in this place be pleasing in your sight, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. 
Okay then, good morning to you all once again. And thank you for joining us and participating in our worship service this morning, whether in person or over the internet. Please always remember that you are a beloved child of God, a cherished sibling in Christ Jesus, and a blessing to this world. You are also always and forever loved unconditionally and offered grace through the sacrifice of Jesus. Today we're going to continue into our second to last week, week number six, of our sermon series, Building Blocks. And we will conclude this series next week on Pentecost Sunday. Throughout this series, by following the selected scripture readings from the Revised Common Lectionary, we've been focusing on some of the stories of the early church. And by doing this, it's my hope that we might learn more about some of the fundamentals of faith. Now, some of these stories have probably been familiar, like Doubting Thomas from our first week or The Road to Emmaus from our second week. But we've also encountered some stories that you may be a little less familiar with, like the story from last week with Paul preaching in the Areopagus, a space to the northwest of the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. As I've previously pointed out, some of these stories actually occurred chronologically after the events of Pentecost, but they're intentionally arranged this way through the season of Easter as it builds towards those special events that we find on the first Pentecost, ones that are foundation, foundational uh, to our faith and to the early church. One of the primary questions that we've been working through together is what commitments are foundational to our Christian identity? We must remember that we claim a belief in things that we cannot see, and we experience the resurrected Christ. We learn to share in community. We ask questions as we grow in faith. We, we try to draw connections for those with different beliefs. We draw strength from shared prayer, and we have come to value all people as a part of the body of Christ. So let us continue this morning focusing on our reading from the book of Acts in our message titled, Seeking Guidance Together. Now something to keep in mind is that for Jesus' closest followers, the ascension marked another turning point. After the crucifixion, they held together and they retreated to the upper room. And we can't really blame them. Their teacher, their friend had just been murdered by the state and who was to say that one of them would not be next? But even gathered together, their time of grieving was short. It was one Sabbath and the night that followed. By Sunday morning, grief gave way to shock and then amazement when Jesus appeared. He appeared first to the women and then to the disciples gathered in the upper room. So for 40 days, they lived in a liminal time, still expecting to see Christ again, holding on to his words that he would one day return. But now, well now he was really truly gone. The men in white at the tomb said so. What would now become of those who had given up everything to follow this Jesus? Those who gave up their families, their way of life, their possessions, their relationships? What might happen next? So while still pondering the last words the risen Lord shared with them, they returned to the upper room where they prayed together. Here in this upper room, this place of sanctuary, we find the remaining 11 disciples, Judas Iscariot having fled and died, and the mother and brothers of Jesus and certain women who apparently the author prefers to remain anonymous. Not that that should surprise us. Women are often unnamed in scripture and pushed into the shadows and the backgrounds and the corners. But we can probably imagine them, Mary Magdalene, perhaps the sisters from Bethany and other women who went to the cross and to the tomb. This group, this collection of misfits, this group comprised of 
several different societal positions and levels, this crowd, if you will, just will not go home. They, this faithful remnant waiting for whatever would come and probably a bit stunned by the supernatural event that they had witnessed, these men and women constantly devoting themselves to prayer, they could not predict what was coming next, or for that matter, what exactly they would be called to do. They only knew that they would be witnesses to the world on behalf of Jesus Christ. Just how would that look? How would that work? Where would it happen? That was still all in the unknown for them. Would they stay close to Jerusalem? Would they need to go out around the world? Would they be safe from persecution? Would they know what to say and what to do when the time came? It definitely felt like there was more that they did not know than what they did know. I can remember back to the time when Sarah and I together decided that I would leave my well-paying information technology job and pursue my education to enter into ministry. There were so many unknowns. Would we be able to sell the house? Would Sarah be able to make a much longer commute for the next three years? Would I even be able to pass any of these classes? I had had practically no religious studies education beyond what I learned in Sunday school, Bible studies, and worship. And this was a master's level program. I had always been a good student, but I hadn't been in a classroom for over a decade. And to be honest, I never really liked school. And just like the disciples, Sarah and I did a lot of praying a few times together, but probably more on our own most of the time. We prayed for clarity and guidance. I know that I prayed for God to make it very clear to me if this was the path that God really wanted me to take. You know, when we experience a major transition in our lives, or even in the life of the church, we most likely find ourselves similarly situated. As I have said countless times before, change can be scary and intimidating. It can be unsettling and anxiety-provoking. It can be something we resist, that we fear. But it can also be something amazing and exciting. It can be joyous and even something we find ourselves welcoming. There is a yearly event that many preachers and pastors attend called the Festival of Homiletics, and I have participated a few times. This gathering is typically held in person, but during the pandemic, like many other things, it was moved into an online format. And that is the format that I have known. I have never attended in person. And recently, one of the speakers shared a story from a previous year's gathering that I would like to share with you. At the gathering, one of the preachers was the Reverend Dr. James Forbes of the Riverside Church in New York City. And he asked those gathered there to pair off with someone that they did not know and to pray for him or her. Reverend Dr. Forbes provided a list of what he called anointings of the spirit that the participants might feel that they needed in their lives. The preacher said, you'll know when I describe the one you need, it will cause a burning in your heart. So everyone began to pair off and the speaker that was sharing this story, looked across the aisle, there in the balcony of this enormous Peachtree Road United Methodist Church. 
And their gaze caught the eye of a man on the other side. And they both walked towards one another, meeting at the brass banister that divided the stairs going up into the balcony. This other man asked the speaker, the one telling the story, what they needed. And the speaker told them that they felt that burning when Reverend Dr. Forbes spoke of asking for willingness. The prayer partner, this other gentleman, a Presbyterian minister from Virginia, he told our speaker a bit about his own situation. And he said, at the same moment our speaker was thinking it, that they were both in much the same position. And yet, this Presbyterian minister did not ask for prayers for willingness. Instead, he asked our speaker to pray on his behalf for obedience. These two people needed different anointings, but they both needed prayer. And they both needed the other person, especially at that moment. We have been blessed with the practice of prayer, a way to talk to God whenever we need to. And when we pray together that shared prayer, it allows us to help each other, to anoint each other, to seek guidance together, even if our needs may not always be the same things. I'd like to challenge you this morning, over the course of this week, to find someone in your life, it doesn't have to be someone you don't know, although if you're really brave and you want to try that, go for it, but find someone in your life and ask them how you can pray for them and ask them to pray for you and what you need. And whether you pray together in that moment aloud, lifting each other's needs, or pray separately. Either way is fine. But I want you to try and do this. It is a way that we can seek guidance together, even when our needs are different from one another. It is a way to be in community with one another. It is a way for us to know other people in our lives, their hearts, their souls, to be able to support them, to lift them to God's grace. So I invite you to that challenge this week, and I hope that you will try it. I can't tell you the number of times when I have done this, the impact it has had on me, and not just for the prayers that are prayed for me, but the prayers that I am giving for the other person. And it's not even just in that moment, it has carried through the days afterwards. It has made me more aware of certain things in the world. It has made me think about things that I might not have thought about. It has become a truly powerful experience. So I again invite you to take up that challenge this week. Amen. I invite you now to turn to our closing hymn number 584. We will be doing verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. So basically skip verse 3.
Beloved children of God and siblings of the resurrected Lord, God loves and cares for each of us. Therefore, cast all anxiety on God and keep alert so that we may remain steadfast in faith with Christ, who supports and strengthens us in all things. And now may the abundance of God bless you, the strength of Christ keep you, and the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, shine upon you now and forever. Amen.